What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to Fudge Muppet. My name is Scott. I'm here with Michael and Drew, as always, for the Elder Scrolls podcast. And today, we are talking all about the Mayamo, or the Sea Elves, or the Tropical Elves, or the Fish Elves, if you want to be derogatory. But which one of you guys would like to take the reins? Um, I'm happy to. So, the Mayamo are basically uh, descended from the Old Ma, like all elves were. But their story is essentially that they were banished from Old Maris. So they had this, I guess, king, but this guy called Orgnum, who was a wealthy nobleman, and he tried to start a rebellion against the Oldma. And then he was banished for this, along with his followers, deep across the seas, past this impenetrable mist, to the island of Pandania, where he became, and they became, sea elves, who are basically like elves except they're bluish and whitish and some even have translucent skin some have scales basically like it's funny but the derogatory term fish elves is kind of like the easiest way to describe them in terms of get an elf mm. and a fish and and well, kind of blend them together and they have a lot of serpent kind of themes and imagery as well which is really cool well, it's in that they're, uh, they've got their like white eyes um, as well. And I like the translucent sort of stuff because I kind of imagine it like a jellyfish, mm. like this sort of colonist look. And you, and it kind of matches up with what you see in ESO. But then there are it those... It matches up with particular... Orgnum being uh, immortal as well. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and then there's that thing with the, the scaled ones where it's sort of... It's said that they're a mix of, of serpent and um, elf and sea elf through sorcery and stuff to get those scaled brutes ones it's in the in the yeah, scaled the, the leviathans book. who yeah. are honestly they sound a lot cooler in the story than they do when you see them they kind of just look like a normal sea elf except their skin's much more scaly they're a bit bigger and like brawnier and and so on very much with the way the various elven exodus has happened you know like imagine the the bosma in valenwood whether or not you you believe they came from oldma stock but they kind of a the elves seem to adapt to new environments when they move there you know you've got such divergent differences between the kaima and the dunma who you know are very much like their ashy environment um the uh, in valenwood with the bosma and that's kind of what what seems to have happened with the sea elves they would have been very similar to the high elves the oldma at one point, but then living on this very inhospitable Isle of Pyandania has has really changed them as a race. Yeah, for sure. It's they're almost like the Argonians of the Elven world, in a way. Like Pyandania is a uh, like a marshy kind of rainforest kind of. Uh, I, Kelp was, mang was mangroves mentioned? Yeah, there it's mangroves. I love the yeah. idea of mangroves. That's like something in an interesting environment you don't. Well, see it's often. the idea that they're kind of no matter where you are in this in this place, you're always at least up to your you know shins in sea in the ocean. So it's yeah. like you know they. It's, it's not exactly. It's described in a lot of different ways, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but it's all of them sound bad and not nice to be there. Like it sounds. I can just imagine it being super humid, super gross just mm. yeah wouldn't wouldn't want to live there at all probably doesn't bother them at all like they kind of seem like they could be like constantly like wet, i mean i imagine it, it used like to bother them probably quite a lot i mean maybe when Orgnum first got there i don't yeah you know most of the sea elves in his um of his race wouldn't be alive today who were there when they initially found it but Orgnum himself must have had some trouble adapting um, from yeah. you know, from how you imagine old Maris, which we're we're going to be talking about a lot, I think, um, versus this new place. Yeah, well, we don't so know don't how we don't know how fast it all happened, and obviously there seems to be a strong magic element to it, considering the mists, like the concept that there's these mists that will always kind of act as a barrier, potentially even as a metaphorical barrier, because we that's do, the way I see it, because we do know that. The sea elves have constantly launched attacks against Somerset Isles, kind of believing themselves to be the true Oldma, which is <laughs> the biggest cope ever, um, because they've clearly been changed by their new environment and being banished. Well, that, that's the thing. They've they've been they essentially attacked Somerset for huge chunks of the first and second eras, failing every single time. So in a way, you know, like King Orgnum is maybe the the worst king i've ever heard of but i guess at least we have heard of him yeah you know? that's true so uh 
It, it really might be a curse. I, I believe it's both, to be honest. Like, obviously, I believe there are mists and that the island is kind of barraged by mist and storms all the time. And that kind of is reflected in their magic as well and their ability to manipulate the weather with certain rituals and different mages who have special magics. Um, but also metaphorical in the sense mm. that no matter how hard they try, this is the thing, they get made up to be so powerful. It's kind of like you hear about a lot of races. It's like, well, if they were so strong, why haven't they taken over all of Tamriel, you know? If they're mm. so strong, how come they haven't been able to take the Somerset Isles? Well, that, that's the thing with these mists. I think if there's if there's mists surrounding Pyandania and they're trying to find Old Maris, you know, their their ancestral home, and they, you know, they're supposed to be very good sailors. They're, you know, they're literally they live in the middle of the ocean. They should be able to find their home, you know, but they can't do it. And I think this this the the idea that the mists keeps them away from it is kind of, you know, it is a coping mechanism for not being able to find this place. But at the same time, I don't necessarily blame them for not being able to find this place because I personally, which we'll talk about, don't believe they came from Old Maris. I believe they came from Somerset. And it seems like the sources are fairly divided on which it is. Mm. Well, like if we were to place, like there are some uh, theories about Pyandania itself being sort of like a sunken version of Old Maris. If we're not, if you just... You don't talk about the idea that Tamriel and all that was Aldmeris, like just pretending that just the basic idea that Aldmeris was just the other continent, like Atmor is another continent kind of thing. Um, that Pyandania could be sort of like a um, kind of an Atlantis vibe that's sort of sunken, but not quite totally. It's sort of all mangroves and, and degenerated into like tropically sort of um, forest stuff. So in in that way that maybe they they have kind of actually found it, but they're still there but this is just an idea it's a real planet of the apes revelation it's like this is earth yeah we do have confirmation that with the element well confirmation as in it's the annotated annuad which is one of the creation stories the explanations for how everyone got where they are but the idea is that when the Olnafe Wars happened, huge amounts of land were sunk beneath the sea and you'd imagine that some of it would you know like Pandania perhaps be somewhat sunken somewhat still there um, so it could be just as much a part of Old Maris as well, technically, anything else. I guess wasn't Old Maris it was once with all of the continents together, like Old Elnafe before it was sundered. Mm-hmm. So technically, it probably would have been part mm-hmm. of it, like this big one continent land. Yeah, that's a bit. Yeah, if we, if we take split. it literally, then yeah. Mm. But that, that's... yeah, it, it is interesting. I'll just bring up. There's a story of uh, I think it's Orgnum and one of his kind of diplomats or, or speak. He has a translator. And the translator mentions uh, that he can speak the languages of four continents. Akavir, um, they're co- they consider Pyandania a continent, Tamriel and Atmora, mm-hmm. um, which is which is cool. So that's in the, that's in the story of the wolf. Clan, I know it's like a, about, it's a bit like, of a narrative. Because a... that's what's interesting. I, this is a, I, I guess it does. I just, it was just a fleeting idea though. I think there is enough like actual evidence, but Organum's only like physical interaction is in that story pretty sure other other times it's like oh organum invaded this place or this place Mm -hmm. or whatever but outside of that he's got like this very like mythological feel like i sometimes i like wonder if you could even spin a theory i was like is organum even real or is he just sort of this like scary sort of figurehead behind these elves because it would also explain like why they just aren't as successful as they could be with this immortal deathless wizard like Maybe they should be able to take the Somerset Isles mm. and stuff. Like, if he's immortal, like, back to Aldmeris kind of thing, as according to him, it's like, that's a long, long time. That's f- over four and a half thousand years, longer. And it's sort of like, well, maybe uh, maybe they just have this big boogeyman, but there is no actual boogeyman, actually. Or maybe he was lived once, but is dead and gone, and they just sort of propagate the scary myth to everyone else. And There, there yeah. is this idea that Orgnum reverses in age. I've, I've read that somewhere as yeah. well. Yeah. Well, I mean, it could be one of those cultures where, you know, you have this kind of cultural god, um, essentially, who once lived, and then the leader of your people essentially fills that role, takes that mantle whenever they become the new monarch. Kind of like a grey fox deal. Yeah, kind of yeah, in, 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 a, in a sense. Not as literal. 
But I don't know, I just thought it was an interesting idea just because outside of the Wolf Queen story, I don't think there is any like said like, oh, here comes the sea elf, here's the interaction, here's mm-hmm. that. And as much as the Wolf Queen thing is a story, it can be completely like legitimate. All of a lot of all the event, events surrounding it happen, not just maybe some of the dialogue and stuff is, you know, storified. In the same way that like the last year of the first era, like the events happened. It's just maybe not the exact interactions. And yeah, it says Patima yeah. shared her bed with Orgnum. Mm. Um, because that's what you that was culturally appropriate or something like that it was deemed to be the polite and diplomatic thing to do <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah however you want to yeah. put it but that, that that's the that's the interesting thing i mean like um uh, one of you would probably tell the story of orgnum how he how he even came to be exiled in the first place but um it, it seems that even the the pocket guide can't decide whether it's somerset or old meris you know, because the, po- the first edition of the Pocket Guide says that, so explicitly says they were exiled from Somerset. Whereas the third edition says they were exiled from Old Meris and said specifically not Somerset. So it is a, it is a bit of a, mm. of a conundrum. Yeah, I, I, for me, I feel like um, I like the idea that Tamriel and kind of like Old Meris, they were already on it. And that they got exiled from the Somerset Isles, and that's what they're constantly trying to ravage and reclaim. Um, hmm. I actually think I, I actually think I prefer the Old Meris split story, and then the kind of the Ultima being the most recognizable strain of Ultima, and that's how they see their enemies. Because if you think about, it, no, no one has an idea where this Old Meris is is because it's gone. But so they're looking for it, and so they're kind of they found this land. And it's got the closest resembled um, elven people to the old mass, so they're kind of like, you know. Mm. The 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 uh, reason I I lean more towards the idea that old Maris is just an idea is when you see descriptions of it. Like um, there's there's one that says the land is shown as an endless city built upon itself over and over again until no trace of nature remained. And the way I interpret that is it's just cultural changes drowning out previous ones to the point where you forget about your history um, because the new thing has taken over and it's just, you know, it's like, say, for example, you've, you've got like a, a culture where you just destroy all the shrines of this pagan religion or whatever and you build your cathedrals over it. Um, and you say, yeah, you, it's the same place, but the old ideals have been forgotten completely. What if what if it's actually the end of a cow for? And like, it's just like, the end of the timeline so they've built so much and there's it says there's no nature remaining and their cities are just so like advanced and built on top of themselves and then Kalpa ends it's very coda like imagine like some sci-fi take yeah, like envisioning it as built on top of each other it's like coruscant yep. in, oh, yeah. coruscant in um then Star a big Wars. mysterious so storm came a big mysterious no. <laughs> storm came yeah from nukes and then start again and all the adra they were just in vaults to survive the the nukes <laughs> and the turning of the Kalpas. Oh. Yeah, but anyway, back, back to more canon stuff. Um, I guess th- to kind of touch on Orgnum a little bit more. So if I didn't explain it too deeply at the start, he was basically a very ambitious nobleman type character. So he had a lot of money and enough money, obviously, to convince people to to join his rebellion against the current people in power and try to take control, essentially, which I can imagine in my head as being on the Somerset Isles, as much as it could also be a different place called Old Maris. And then he lost. And actually, that's funny, isn't it? Because that, that's an example of him losing before any kind of curse. He lost straight up mm. before there was any, like, being banished to Pyandania or having the mists preventing them from coming back. So he sounds like he's just a very salty elf. <laughs> mm. So he lost, mm. they get banished to Pyandania, which is considered far southwest of Tamriel. And um, yeah, they're stuck there, became the sea elves, adapted all their culture to it as well, all their materials, um, everything. What, what do we... Th- what do we think of the really sort of off the cuff thing? I think it's mentioned in one of the pocket guides that he is said to be the serpent god of the of Satakal, associated with like the Yakutan stuff. Mm, it, it, like at first, my first thing is like that's a meme because Satakal in himself is a bit of like a embodiment of like similar to Anu and Padme. It's kind of like a very like he, 
King Organum is not the cosmic forces yeah. of Vanu and Padme. I think if otherwise Carl be... wasn't a snake, hmm. they, there would be no connection drawn, except for maybe hmm. the fact that he seems to be undying, but being undying doesn't really is not enough to, to warrant oh, this. See, now that is a sick idea that they should, if they ever reveal more about Organum or so on, imagine the whole idea about him being the deathless wizard is him just shedding his skin over and over again. Yeah. Like, kind of, mm. that's he how could he be. is actually the deathless like they, wizard. Uh, look, I'll say this. He could easily have some kind of influence with Sadakal or like, you know how there's different versions of different entities, like whatever theirs is. Obviously, they're in touch with some crazy magic and stuff and some higher entities mm -hmm. like all talk about their rituals that we see in elder scrolls online but look if you were like the incarnation of sadakal you'd think that you would be more successful but i i just don't even know if it's possible it's kind uh, of what like i'm saying is even I... if it was you, you lose yeah, every time you don't come across like you have the backing of gods because mm -hmm. it's like imagine it's kind of like saying that you're like the you're like the the embodiment or like person like you embody gravity like some kind of <laughs> universal force like you literally are gravity it kind of just the the forces are so abstract in the way that like just they're just it's literally just chaos and 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 order colliding and that it's kind of like well, not only that I I, but um uh, at least at the time you know when he was when he was prominent may um th this is imagine being told that you're the incarnation of a god you've never heard of you know, the, the only way the Seals would really know about Sadakal as a concept is is from going to Hammerfell post um, the the Exile. migrations of the Yakudans. Uh, the only other thing they could do is go to Yakuda. Like, mm. if you had the Yakuda with the Empire of the Left-Handed Elves, perhaps they were in communication yeah. with or trading. Or but still, I think overall it's a bit of a, a bit of a meme. Like, it's not. It's just very, like you said, based on oh. He's a he's a serpent type god described in in some mythology, or maybe he is this because they also have sea serpents, and it's kind of like, yeah, I don't really. Yeah, don't that, wh whoever you know wrote that connection into the law, it probably needs to be fleshed out a lot more before a, a real connection can be made. Because yeah, I don't think that they ever elaborated on it unless it's from a part of ESO well, that I didn't play. While we're on the topic of snakes, we can start talking about their serpent. Well, their snake magic and their big sea serpents and stuff that they use as steeds and war beasts. Sure, sure. But so yeah. there's these sea serpents. Like you can actually see them. You have you go into combat with one in the Elder Scrolls Online, and I believe you even see one in the Adventures Redguard. Um, but they're basically massive sea serpents, kind of typical of what you would imagine in a fantasy universe that exist around Pyandania, and the sea elves have managed to kind of tame. Like I wouldn't say domesticate because that kind of gives me the wrong gives the wrong vibes, but essentially use them as kind of war steeds and battle mounts, so they can ride them across the seas. I assume go under the water and jump out, um, kind of on its back and things like that. And they're very, I guess, a formidable foe. Like having the creatures of the water in addition to your naval forces is pretty op. Yeah. Yeah, and they absolutely. can also summon them, so they've they've kind of learnt to use them with magic as well. Yeah, I was uh, a little bit because um, so you have all of those sea serpents and their snakes and stuff, and you imagine them coming along with their ships, which are described really cool in the Wolf Queen books. Um, it was uh, insectoid, certainly with its member membranous sails and rugged chitin hull but she had seen similar if not identical sea craft in morrowind no if not for the flag which was markedly alien yada yada but the whole idea that it's this big sort of like insectoid kind of ship that they that they use alongside these serpents would is so cool then again we do see a mar mar ship in eso and it kind of looks just like a normal ship which is Kind of disappoint. I mean, they could always just have normal ships as well. Yeah, especially if they're not trying to draw it's... too much attention to themselves. Like, really, the ones in Elder Scrolls Online are kind of the, just there to form a temporary alliance and do some pillaging and, like, nothing. Yeah. Yeah, nothing and I guess major. Patima would be probably describing the the flagship, you know, Orgum's per, Orgnum's personal ship as well. So perhaps it's a lot... I mean, yeah, it's boring to imagine it that way, but perhaps it's just a lot nicer than all the other ones. Mm. 
they but, that, yeah. they are said to be absolutely vicious on the water like there's a really uh cool book called a sailor's guide to sea elves that you can find in the elder scrolls online and it, it makes them sound super intimidating so i'll just kind of go through the book and read a, a few of the things so it says they're at home on the water which we can all assume would you two think that they have any water breathing capabilities Maybe I like that. I don't think they necessarily have to. It could even just be like a, you, you know, it could just be maybe they could breathe under the water for ten yeah, minutes. Yeah, exactly. Like they don't have to be like livable underwater. Yeah. But you know, like any mammal or anything, I know, like dolphins or whales, they need to come up for air, but they can, yeah, that, you know, breathe for ages. That would underwater. make sense to me, especially if they were on the back of a sea serpent that kind of, you know, did a duck dive under a boat and came up the other side or something. Not that you'd need mm. to hold your breath for that long, but. You, you know what I mean? Especially, they, they talk about them um, using ambush tactics a lot. And one of the things this mm. book says is that the Marimus ships can remain at sea indefinitely so long as it's seaworthy. So they kind of can just stay out there. They don't need to like go back to land or do anything like that. And they do tend to bait you into pursuing them. So some of the tactics, it says, never pursue a retreating sea elf vessel, even if you think they are hobbled. They will bait you into thinking you can catch them, but make no mistake, sea elf cutters are faster than any ship in our fleet, which I think is really cool. Soon, you'll be, soon you will find yourself lured out into the open ocean, unable to safely retreat while they circle you like sharks. Your food stores will dwindle, and once you are finally too weak to put up a fight, the marimal will swoop in to slaughter you. It is cowardly. It is a cowardly but effective tactic. I also like that... Um, it talks about how the best way to deal with them is sometimes how people recommend dealing with sharks. Like it's, there's one quote about like, if you can bloody their nose, like kind of do that in the sense that attack them, like don't run. If you run, you're screwed. If you mm. can stay and put up a fight, that's your best chance of winning. Yeah. Don't, don't retreat yeah. and also don't pursue supposedly. Even it says never flee a sea elf vessel unless you can see land, but even then do so with great care. It's not a matter of if they'll overtake you, it is when. The best course of action is to stand and fight. At least then you have some hope of coming out ahead. I also love just the additional part. So like you can imagine them like coming after you, um, but the specifically that the sailors the sea elves are supposed to be like nimble acrobats and stuff sort of like jumping on boarding mm -hmm. the ship so you can imagine them catching up and they're just all like swinging over and just being it sounds like, really scary it's really cool. like rapidly just kind of slimily climbing up the ship that was actually described as one of those leviathans you were talking about the half sea elf half sea serpent mm. hybrids in the story and ultima describes one kind of like coming up the side of the ship and like coming they're over but then when you see them in elder scrolls online they don't look like they'd like mentioning that. that it's sort of interesting to uh, to actually think about their biology in terms of like they could they've there's examples where they've shaped their biology obviously by merging sort of sea serpent kind of stuff with themselves that kind of like at least makes me think a little bit more that maybe their biology was self-determined rather than this sort of degeneration or curse mm, i guess I mean, we just because like I just in terms of the curse, like I don't know what like what's the the problem. Like if anything, there they've got advantages. We I think it's like absolutely a, a necessary for their survival to yeah. develop these skills. But that's yeah. why I'm thinking maybe it is a magical sort of like a, a willingness thing. Like yeah, this is better. We've we've got to do this to survive in Pyandania. We have to change to this mm. and doing it of themselves rather than someone putting a curse on them. Because look, I tell you what, if I was cursing the the sea elves or Organum's bunch of elves and turning them into something. I don't think I was going to turn them into nimble acrobatic super sea. Yeah. You can like sea conquerors. Conjure like that's kind of to, to destroy your fleet and things like this. It's yeah. Like, it's kind of counterintuitive. Yeah, you're basically perfectly crafting them to come back and take, take, uh, take the land back. But, uh, you know, and, that, yeah. and that's the thing about, uh, the, the sea elves is I, I don't think they could, um, create the largest Navy, but I think per vessel per sailor, they probably have the most capable, seafaring uh, force naval force well, it's, and it's the reason it, why the high elves became such yeah. good um na uh, such a good naval power is mm -hmm. because of the yeah because they got to deal with, yeah. deal with them and and as well as the slowed and then it's like, yeah, sure. yeah. And, and in terms of them changing scott i will say this there is a uh, a text the chosen people of old maris um which is basically i guess propaganda where they mm. believe that they are the true um old mary kind of 
blood, the true race, and that the Ultma are a mongrel race. Um, yeah, I'm not sure how they come up with that. <laughs> it's, it, it, I know, but it's like the first line. Many still believe that the Marama race of Pandania diverged from the racial line of the Ultma when they were exiled from Somerset Isle. Uh, oh, so they, there you go, Somerset Isle as criminals. This is a great traitorous lie of the Ultma. Um, tapestries in the Crystal Tower reveal that the great Marama race is directly descended from the purest strain of our, of our Aldmeri ancestors. We certainly did not just come to, from just... Somerset. Just to indulge it a little bit, though, like, technically, we have no idea what an old man looks like. And if you were to look at, like, that sort of translucent sort of skin of the sea elves, you can kind of imagine that being, like, a protoform, kind of, like, m more closely aligned with, um, like, a spiritually sort of looking thing. Like, they're kind like of, a, like, a moldable, a stuff. moldable jelly, like a Play-Doh. And then, yeah, and then, and they, then maybe... they've been able to show how moldable they are by changing into half-serpent hybrids and, like... Yeah. But wait, so are you insinuating outside, that they could be closer to what Ultima should be <laughs> than well, can, no, can I just but <clears throat> outside of Ultima people saying that obviously like, you know, we're the descendants of the Altmeri and so on, to throw it out there, it's like they they just said that as much I as think, any like I think really, he's got I know, a little it, bit of Drew's contrarian blood in his coffee. No, no, no. Okay, <laughs> you guys are being the contrarians here. No, that's, so, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying I think okay, he's right, got yeah. some of your. Oh, yeah, gotcha. Yeah, but it's. I'm just. Yeah. Well, the thing is, it's, no, it's just an idea. Yeah. But indulge it because, like, really, the only thing that says that Ultima are so close um, is that you know that's the conventional idea. In the same way. Um, Interestingly, that the Somerset Isles and the Ultima culture ha is different from this pure strain of Ultima culture uh, by like the Sigic Order, saying the Sigic Order have you know preserved the old ways and stuff, and even Ultima sort of culture has even diverged from. But that look at what the Sigic Order look like, and and you know, yeah, so, yeah and, know, what, and what the, the Aelids Ohio's. kind of look like more, and what the Dureni look like, and. So if we just assume, if we just assume that Old Meris existed, Old Elden Fate is a place that they came from. You imagine that you know, even if they are unable to find it again, they're bringing over their their culture, they're bringing over their religion, and their god, the, the gods of the the Oldma, uh, and you'd think they'd have a lot more, um, you know, sea based um, elements if there's a chance but what that I'm, the sea elves if, are But close. if they descended from the old Ma, what I'm sort of saying is imagine there's old Maris and imagine that they all kind of have that chameleon, like that sort of translucent sort of skin, like they've only just sort of become mortal away from this sort of more spiritual thing, physical. Then they had a big argument. Then Pai and the Nier ones got split off and in this Pai and the Nier place. And then from there comes down, you know, the, the splits and so on. And they look sort of more similar, like more um, shaped in sort of a mortal skin form. And then you've just, but you've had this like isolated group that have been isolated way Look, back. Look, I then. like I like your theory. I, like I wouldn't take that as being the most likely case, but I would take it as a cool possibility. I, I like mm. I like mm. what you're doing there. It makes the ancestry idea. Yeah. It makes the ancestry idea a bit weird because I guess mm -hmm. if you're you know if you, if you're if the baseline for 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 elves is to be these kind of like undefined chameleon like we don't quite know what we are yet. It, it does it undermines all of the ancestor stuff but at the same time perhaps that is the the ultima but that's what may thing, yeah maybe the but... ultima because the ultima do were like you know there's such thing as ultima propaganda <laughs> and them making them like their obsession with ancestor stuff like even much like a lot of like real world cultures and stuff like they have get obsessed with ancestors yet they have no clue what they were like or what they do or it turns out that these ancestors actually had different philosophical ideas and stuff like that so like it is possible for it to be adulterated. Um, and you have also, like, just when you consider things like, you know... It would be interesting, like, what, what what's the Snow Elves' relation in terms of, like, would they consider themselves pure or they inherently derivative? Because perhaps the Snow Elves could make the argument, no, we were the original. They have a same old religion or, or whatever, and then maybe everyone else got, you know, they got more golden skin or whatever because mm. of the sun. You know what I mean? Like, it's kind of like, you know, chicken... <laughs> egg kind of thing and a lot of it when you're dealing with such like mythology obviously the elven mythology uh yeah. of the old and stuff is more um repeated and, and and spread and so on but it's the same kind of mentality where it's like here's the elven version of events but that doesn't mean it's the true one in the same way you compare what's the yakutan version of events or the or the nord version of events and stuff like that so there's really i, I guess no... you can cast doubt on it but i suppose 
There's no evidence whatsoever to support the idea that the sea elves are closer to. It's just kind of like maybe and they have translucent translucent skin, which kind of has a theme of what being see-through and therefore easier to change. Yeah, no, yeah, well, but it's just yeah, sort of it, saying... It also, like, you know, it's... the translucent skin works perfectly with being an aquatic race. Yeah. But but at the same time, I, dude, I 100% think it's a cool idea because it, it, it does it does lend credence to the idea mm. that, wow, these these um, these um elven peoples, when they move to, to a different biome, change so dramatically, which does seem unusual. That's not really the case with humans. Yeah. So, you know, mm. it is interesting. Yeah. For sure. And even most of the elves, like outside of snow elves, like the rest of the elves sort of had uh, reasons behind their transformations mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. That's... Yeah. Like, they're, they're, they're thoroughly explained. They didn't just transform. But, but what about yeah. the aliens? Yeah, I, I guess there's not much there, but they kind of just look really very close to elven. Like, they look as different as, like, the Chimera or the whatever. Like, they don't look drastically different like the dark elves or, or the snow mm -hmm. elves. I don't think. I will say, so I, I guess I'll continue on to what we were talking about, about the sea elves and them at sea, but they also can control the sea. So on their ships, they can have sea mages that conjure wind and storm to, quote, toss you about like a toy boat. Um, and so it's kind of recommended that you kill, you know, it's like a boss fight. Kill the sea mage first if you come across one of their ships. Tactical move. Kill the sea mage then focus on the rest of them so they can't use the actual waves in the water to their advantage. But on top of the waves, on top of the weather, on top of just being really good sailors, they also have their beasts. So they have not only their sea serpents, which they can summon, ride, or just, you know, have around them to fight against things in, in the sea, but they also have other things. There's the winged reef vipers that can leap out of the water and come onto the deck of the ship. Um, and... Have you seen what they look like before? Yeah. The, the reef the reef I vipers. I probably have. They're kind of like a they're in ESO, aren't they? Is they're kind of treated as just like a, a standard mob, but I guess yeah. um you know the yeah. the sea elves were able to kind of It's like a combination control them. Of a, like a f Yeah. I imagine it's sort of them in the sea cuz you don't see them in the sea but like as a like a flying fish combined with a Yeah, that that's kind of pretty thing. much what they look like. They've got these almost bat-like wings. And then they're like a smaller sea serpent. It's like, get the big sea serpent, make it really li like little by comparison and chuck some wings on it. And uh, but, that's what yeah. you get. That's kind of the awkward thing about the sea elves is, you know, I, I, I make fun of them saying that for two eras, they attempt to take over this island and fail constantly. But as we're talking about now, they're, they're a very formidable force on the ocean. But it's one of those situations where I feel like a lot of the time, if you're a high elf on Somerset, you, you know, like you're terrified you're going to lose your navy and all of this. But then you're just like, oh, wait, I'll just step back onto the shore. And now they see, I was like, oh, what do we do now? Yeah. Or, <laughs> you know, like they really. Well, they did. Um, I mean, they did have help, but like there was uh, during the War mm. of the Isle, like they did. They like, came close. They are still a threat. Like, you know, the Somerset Isles had to get the intervention of, of the Empire and the Sidgicks and stuff to Supposedly, to them. yeah. Like, well, it seems like a, yeah, because it was a freak storm. Basically, in the War of the Isle, which is that year one ten, the Isle of yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which is also that same kind of things. Oh, I before. take that yeah. as canon for sure. It seems like they were on the verge of a, a huge success in this in this war, which is you know it happened in the third era one ten, which is a long time after they first started trying to take the Isles. Seemed like they'd won it, and then from the Isle of Arteum comes a great storm that just destroys mm. them. <laughs> And I know that's that's in the obviously it says like that's it just says Isle of Arteum, but in the third pocket guide, um, it explicitly says um, yeah. The I'm literally finding it during the War of the Isle in, in uh, 110 Third Era, the Marimo the Pai and Denir were successful, in, nearly successful in conquering the ancient enemy, and the Ultima had to call upon the aid of the Sigics and the Empire to mm. defend them. It says the storm brewed by the Sigics of Arteum. So here in the same source, yeah. it says they it's literally the, brewed it too. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, it's hard to be... But it is it is hard to be scared of an enemy that for, like, so long has always lost. Like, the, the reputation that they'd have 
would be like, mm. oh, they've never beaten us before. And the Sidgic Order are the biggest meme plot device. I think they're really cool, but they're always used for like, and then the Sidgic Order came and used unknown powerful magics to save the world. Mm. You know, it's it's got a little bit of that kind of Superman motif in, in mm. terms of just like, oh, what, are the, what can't the Sidgic Order do? Nothing. <laughs> Because mysticism yeah. is mysterious and OP. But Except in the College of Winterhold, they're just like, you will succeed. We'll leave you to it. Yeah, yeah. They're like, <laughs> so, yeah. we already know the future. We know you'll succeed. But here we are. Oh, but don't worry. You'll win. Great dangers are coming. <laughs> but you will prevail. So don't worry, man. But yeah, I know. Anyway, I will also say something that is quite cool. I just remembered about their biology of the Leviathans, these um, scaled kind of serpent mix hybrid specifically in the story um the leviathan kind of pins down this uh um ultima i guess and it says i was no match for the oh sorry it says um where is it there's a the jaw pops out like a snake i'm trying to find the quote there, there it goes. Right. Oh, Scott, you love that. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll, so she was on me in an instant, pinning me to the deck with her great size, ready to strike me down with a killing blow, or so I thought. Oh. Instead, she regarded me with a chilling dispassion as I froze like a mouse that's locked eyes with a snake. I was both captivated and terrified. It was the popping of her jaw, stretching out of place to swallow me, that finally snapped me out of my shock and gave me the sense to struggle. I was no match for the Leviathan's strength, but I managed to wrest a hand free and drive it into the back of her throat. Oh yeah. The gout of flame she choked on put an end to her perverse existence, but the mark she left on me I'll carry until the end of my days. If you should ever see the scaled elves lurking below the waves, my prayers go with you. That's true love. Whoa. I will say too, um, completely, not completely unrelated, still about CLs, but um, aesthetically ESO did a really good job. Like besides adding like the Leviathans and stuff like that, the um, I really like just, you know, it's just interesting aesthetic to see all the sort of like shell looking things and the serpent motifs and stuff like that. Mm. Like there's, there's some really nice looking... It's kind of nice to just see something. There's this one picture in here, so I've, I've actually made it the thumbnail for this, and it's got the, um, uh, it's got like a mage chick and, and a dude in full armor, and I just love seeing it like next to a real tropical, beautiful kind of looking environment. You yeah. know what I mean? Like you can kind of imagine it. Like you know. yeah. Well, uh, what do you guys think about King Orgnum's coffer? Okay, so this is the uh, what the the chest you can get in mm. Elder Scrolls Online that just gives you heaps of money constantly i feel like there's there's more to it so do you think it's like how he was a rich nobleman like he had this enchanted chest back in the day that well, could this just is give a little... him all his money yeah it's it's kind of like a a bit of a macguffin but it's it's like the way i imagine it is because you know his origin story he's this phenomenally wealthy nobleman i imagine it's like because it can just continuously generate gold it's kind of like in a metaphorical sense it's like his it's his heart in this box and I could just imagine a really cool quest line where, you know, you've got to steal the key to it from around his neck while he sleeps and you get in a fight on it like a spinning wheel and stuff like that it could be really well, cool. Here's an interesting thing. He is said to have lost the coffer, right, in the battle against the Empire. Nothing, nothing. Uh, go on. I'm, okay. I'm, re I'm really confused. You just, you just look like you're about to crack up. I'm not, I'm just wondering how many Pirates of the Caribbean references I can sneak into this episode going unnoticed. <laughs> oh, the heart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, like yeah, that entire right. thing was a reference. Very cool, bro. <laughs> yeah. Mark on another one. Oh. Very smart. But, but what I was saying is, um, so it was, so basically it was supposedly lost then by Orgnum, but we also haven't had a mention of Orgnum since that point, since the 110th year of the Third Era. Like he's had no impact anywhere else since he lost his coffer so if it was kind of maybe it is his heart mm. and he's dead <laughs> or or the gold thing maybe he doesn't have the same amount of resources and stuff to like fund his uh fleets and so on and if you consider that the fleets are built with wooden ships unless there's lots of like if it really is this giant mangrove mm. i don't know how conducive that is well, i was gonna say yeah i was gonna say how valuable is gold um to the sea elves on their remote isle of pandania like well, maybe they need it for wood. Maybe they need to import wood because they live in this giant sort of misty mangrove. With I feel like, like we'd know limited... more about their trade relations yeah, in that case, though. Because that's the thing is they're so but, mysterious, yet, oh, they're they're trading with 
The elsewhere. thing is, I feel like everyone trades a lot more than we hear because there's, there's lots of little pieces of lore. It's like, oh, this person trades to Akavir. Oh, this person's a translator who's been to, you know, at Mora Tamriel and Akavir and Yakuta and kind of like jumping around mm. everywhere. And there are, and there's also, remember, there are more islands that I guess might not have been mentioned. Like there's islands in between here and uh, Tamriel and Yakuta, between Akavir and Tamriel. So there's lots of potential like trade spots and so on. So for example, you could be just imagine someone in Morrowind is trading with Ezreal Net, but you never gonna you're not gonna hear about yeah, that, that. But but it, it seems isolated. Some of those know? islands, I believe there was a there's some creature called a lizard bull, which is a mysterious beast race. They're indigenous to the islands along the coast of Pyandania. Um, mm. It says they were accidentally discovered during the interregnum on an ill-fated expedition to Pyandania by a crew of pirates who were led by the infamous Captain Wareshark. Not, not, not the... Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. I do remember this because I was... Um, I thought that when, when I read that, I was like, is that just like a fabricated, like, funny tale like about this Captain Wareshark? So that's why I was like, I'm not going to necessarily take it, this lizard bull thing seriously and talk about it in the, in the, in the beast folk race. Oh, because it's cause the I'm saga like, of Captain Wareshark. Yeah, the and that's Pyandania the only source expedition. for it. So I'm like, this sounds a bit who, funny. Who knows? So. But it really does seem like a lot of their lore has kind of been added in as a meme. Um, but you, you can't really, you know, you can't really say much about it because there's not a whole lot to to dispute or to work with. It's so I, mysterious. Yeah, I, I guess the thing I would say is just like, we just have to work with what we've got. We don't know what's mm. true and what isn't. And that's why they're one of the most mysterious kind of races out there i will say they they obviously have a, a a personality and they have interests like anyone else there's um a, a marima spyglass in elder scrolls online and the description calls it a brass spyglass engraved with a raunchy marima limerick you know mm. and there's also a, I, um a sea elf that you meet that has a relationship um i believe with a high elf yeah, well, there's even things where you see them as, like, members of the Akaviri Dragon Guard. Hmm. Like, because, well, yeah, but, like, um, but, you know, anyone can, there's multiple members of the Dragon Guard. Like, you know, it's plausible that a couple mm. just joined. But it would, if they were going to add any race into the Elder Scrolls Six, I think Sea Elf would be the best. If they wanted to sort of advertise the Elder Scrolls Six, and now there's 11 races that you can play as. Like, I definitely think Sea Elves both like Law like if it's say in Hammerfell or even High Rock, it's sort of like the coastal area. So it's closer proximity kind of thing. And it would be cool. And you could imagine some cool like gameplay kind of effects and stuff just for a, for a normal elf, not the one with like, you know, with an opening jaw mm. and like all of the scales and stuff, I guess. Yeah. It's not a lot. I mean, they, they have made them uh, not the right word considering they're elves, but you get the point when I say they've humanized them a bit more, you know, yeah. like this, this yeah. Castile in the Elder Scrolls online and uh, her affair, I guess. And then the sea elves who are not happy about it. But I, I think they would look, they would, they, I don't know, I, f I can imagine an Elder Scrolls Six Hammerfell with them. If there was any, if you were to convince me of any, I don't think they need more playable mm. races. They should flesh out the ones that have more. They're, they're said to hate the, the Ultimus so much. Yeah, yeah, they, they could diversify the races more. Um, I definitely wouldn't want but, to have playable like Akaviri races. It gets a little bit overwhelming. Todd, How Todd Howard's just straight up said anyway, he's like, I think 10's... He's literally said before, like tens. Uh, I think tens enough, mm. but I, I'd be more interested in diversifying them more. But funnily enough, Skyrim sort of kind of got rid of a lot of the diversity in them. Well, that's it. well, once you make some races playable as well, is the way the games tend to go is they become more generic by virtue of being playable. Because um, I, I, I personally think when they portrayed sea elves, they could have they could have done a lot more like giving them even just giving them like webbed hands and feet and, and things that make it seem like they've spent generation after generation in the ocean um mm. versus just pale high elves like pale blue high elves um and i think if, if they become playable as we've seen with the beast races they tend to just make them more generic you know versus morrowind where if you're an argonian you can't wear boots and things like this yeah for sure well, I guess I guess we should talk a little bit more about um, their magic 
and some of the stuff we learned about them in the Elder Scrolls Online, seeing as they have uh, blood sacrifice. They have some of the, the strangest magics, or the least understood. So they have their serpent magic, and their ability to control sea serpents, and they've got um, the ability to control the weather. Although that was seen with Halden in Skyrim, in the um, Rise in the East quest. <clears throat> he was a mage who mm. could control the, the weather, and he was a red guard, I believe. Weather well, controlling yeah. is like the, it's the not... Nords, you know, using the voice, obviously have yeah. a lot of access to that as well. There's been plenty of, but, but it's control. not just weather. It's like literally controlling the waves and particularly like the sea, as well as mists and storms and and things of that nature. But I, I guess it's not it's not completely unique. Um, if I just try and find some of the... They're probably also not even the best at it. Sigics probably... Oh, like of course. If the Sigics could yeah, brew the storm but to the beat Sigics them, it's are better than like... everyone at everything, you know? Like, yeah. the Sigics are just the Sigics. You can't really compete. But anyway, they have these totems of um, kind of like... Uh, that they use blood rituals for. So it seems like they tie people to them and then kind of bring down the, like a storm or electrocution onto them. Um, which is kind of scary. <laughs> here's here's a take what I think they could have done. They a they should have stayed with the chitinous sort of look on the on the ships and so on. But I think that they should have if they wanted to look at real world culture insp inspirations for them. I think they should have gone like a little bit more like maybe like Polynesian or something or like some more of those sort of motifs. I mean it fits because you know Polynesian getting all to Hawaii and Fiji and all that kind of those places they were very good seafarers. Mm. Um, and navigators and stuff and i feel like they could have used some of those sort of motifs and i get a little bit of it just by virtue of there being a totem it's not much but like but do you know what i mean like i, I think it would just be a cool mm. um look and especially especially you know you could even have like some sort of polynesian tattoo type tattooey inspired things on their translucent skin would like stand out heaps and like uh yeah i don't know i, I just think it would be cool yeah for sure um in terms of their rituals, I guess I've got a little bit more info. So they can create hurricanes, right? Um, it's also said by someone that if they're doing blood sacrifice, it's kind of like a, a desperate thing in the sense that they need to gather a lot of power and like quickly. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, it says they dragged... So here's a quote. It's like, those filthy Marima dragged my mates up and tied them to these serpent-shaped statues. Then they started chanting and lightning surrounded them. That's when the storm began to form around the island. It was a terrible sight. Um, the sea vipers were so caught up in the ritual, I slipped free. Then one of the sea vipers... Uh, so, so her friend tries to... She tries to grab Sir, but the lightning held him fast. Then one of the sea vipers yanked at him and the Marima's wrists began to glow. And then they had lodestones. So it seems like they're not immune to the lightning that they use lodestones to avoid getting electrocuted themselves. And I'm pretty sure right. that's how the player kind of traverses that mission as well. Yeah. Well, if Pokemon's anything to go by, you'd think they'd be more susceptible to lightning damage <laughs> anyway. So, but yeah. Super I don't effective. Know. <laughs> There's also the story, uh, which is really interesting. Do you two know the story of. Finoriel, this, this Bosma who swam uh, to Pyandania. I've never heard of this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, read I have a blind spot. Briefly. Fill are me you, in. Are you boys ready for a tale? Okay. Mm -hmm. So, Finoriel, born in the deep woods, a small village in the Malabar Tor region of Valen Wood. She, I'm just trying to, I'm, it's too long to read the whole thing, so I'm just trying to like skip through to the best parts. Okay. Unwilling to die without extract, extracting vengeance upon her husband's killers, Fenoriel swam the whole way to the southern island of Pyandania. She visited her wrath upon the Marima, killing indiscriminately until she was spent. As she lay dying atop the highest sea tower, the Sea Elves' greatest warrior came to claim her head as a trophy. Instead, she grabbed him and threw herself to the waves far below. So she basically just went and did a massive slaughter of the sea elves okay, and then yeah. died atop a mountain. I, I take back anything I said about the sea elves not being that bad in terms of combat because that's woeful. If, if, that's, if someone's just swam... A Bosma you know, was like, stuff it, I'm going to play Andania. I'll see you soon. BRB. Yeah, she's absolutely exhausted from this journey to a place she doesn't even know really where it is. 
<laughs> and then wash. What a story, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I'm surprised all the... Because there's the tales that Pyandene is surrounded by kelp and basically it traps all of the ships that try to invade except for the Marima ships, obviously, who seem to be kind of at one with the land. I'm surprised she didn't get not only trapped by kelp, but killed by sea serpents. It just... Mm. It almost sounds like it's not true. No way. <laughs> <laughs> I think it um, says in death her soul journeyed back to Malabar Tor to the sacred grove of Treehenge so that her soul could be rooted. Hmm. All incarnations of the Green Lady, known as matrons in death, root themselves at Treehenge to ensure the Green Lady's past memories are preserved. So it sounds like so she was the green lady so it's like she's gifted with some like godly some godly juice mm. you know last thing i guess to mention as well is like beyond just being raiders and stuff they've also been slavers as yeah. well in the um they're in the in the hinterlands of hughes bane in the latter years of the first era until the second era they were still um they were slavers which also, I've, to be honest, in back in the day, a lot of like piratey type of raiders would. Mm. It's an easy, you just, you go in, you raid, you take a bunch of prisoners, go to somewhere and sell them. Yeah. So. Pretty look, easy Their leader isn't the best role model ever. So it <laughs> no. makes sense. Yeah. Mm. But yeah, I think that pretty much wraps up all of the, uh, mm. the sales, I'd right? say so. Yeah, there's not too much else to say. We know that they had some kind of pirate gangs in the Elder Scrolls online but you know we've big yeah, we've, we've we've covered them enough <laughs> anyway like in terms yeah. of their significance and what they were doing so that finishes up the Sea Elves podcast thank you all so much for watching go follow us on Twitter if you haven't already links in the description below and we'll be back to nerd out with you all again very soon